Shut up and sit down. Yeah, for sure. All right, so do you want to, what the fuck is this? So do you want to, uh, do you want to do this micromanagement thing? Yeah, let's do it. Hey, everybody, I'm Tara Walker, and that's Ted Bauer, and we are at Tara and Ted Talk, and today we're talking about micromanaging. I don't even know where to begin on this topic, because it's so, it's so big, and it impacts so many people, I think. Um, okay. I guess, like, first of all, I feel like a lot of times when people talk about it, they don't address the psychology of it. Okay. I think that's probably a good place to start or a logical place to start. It's like, I think a lot of times it happens because, like, the way we hire people is pretty inefficient, especially in, like, white collar, but in other industries and verticals as well. And, like, it creates all this overlapping, like unclear BS, and people like have a fundamental need to like feel relevant at like a place they spend eight to ten hours a day, and so they want stuff to control. So there's that I think is a big element of it, and then the second thing is we promote people based on like hitting some number or like completing tasks for people, and like then people become managers and like they're getting the bigger salary largely because they're managing people now, but they don't know how to do that. So they just fall back on what they know. So like the task work that they used to have, they just micromanage that instead of actually being like a leader, you know? Um, like I'm on one contract now where they promoted this girl, like a, two levels up. And like all she does is like, the task work that she used to do, now it's assigned to somebody else, and she has a higher salary, but all she does is micromanage that task work, because it's all she knows how to do. And like, that stuff is like, very common. So, I think those are kind of the two like, origin stories of it. Also, just people being ineffective, like cash hole managers. I think a lot um, of it comes from um, fear of losing control, Yep. Or, or the fact that you're not in control of other facets of your life. Right, for sure. And I saw a thing on, I think it's Adam Grant, like research, but I didn't read the whole article. I saw a thing on Quartz that was saying, you're, and I mean, this is like not rocket science, it's pretty logical, but if you feel like your marriage or relationship in your like 30s and 40s is stressful or there's you don't have control within that you take it out way more on people at work and that's especially if you're like a direct manager like a person with like direct reports um and i would say too man like just anecdotally i know so many dudes that like they don't really have good control of their kids like their kids are kind of like all over the place and you kind of like you just think like, man, if there's that much chaos and you don't have that control at home, where are you going to go try and get it? You're going to go get it at the only other place you're spending a lot of time, you know? Um, so like the big problem I have with it too is there's no real like that I can think of, and maybe I'm naive. There's no real like organizational thing that can be put in place to like reduce micromanaging it has to happen at like an individual level yeah like no, i don't awesome. think there's any hr program out there that can solve it like you can tell people like hey let your employees do their stuff until they mess up when they mess up then you can course correct them but like you're always going to have these two or three guys that just like desperately want control fear losing control so I don't think you can ever wholly eliminate it. So like uh, the other thing that's like a humorous anecdote is I, uh, uh, I was looking to see if I had ever written shit about it. And I found one post and I'm like virtually certain that I wrote it when I was either drunk or potentially high because it's like one of the dumbest things I've ever written. And like I was looking at the timestamp on it in WordPress 
And I wrote it at like 10.30 p.m. on like a Thursday night once. So it's not very useful. But, yeah, I just think like, I, don't, I just don't like, I still think you could ever fully eradicate it, and that's what sucks, you know? Right. That's yeah. True. Well, and it, you know, it, it, back to our conversation about how our relationships, similarities between, God, what were we talking about? <laughs> work and, and work and personal. Uh, work and personal, yeah. 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 And um, um, I think that, um, it, well, it bleeds the other way, too. If you're, if you are not feeling like you're in control of really of any aspect of your life, so even your work life, it's going to bleed into your home life too, where you start nitpicking. And so there's this fear of being out of control or whatever. And you start, you know, pecking away at the people that, um, especially the people that love you because they're the easiest people to attack because they're always just kind of going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also like, uh, uh, it's also like, just in general, I think people miss this, is that obviously the people you spend the most time around are the people that are going to bear the brunt of like bullshit that you're going through. And like, for better or worse, a lot of people spend a lot of time with their coworkers. Like they might not always want to, but it's like, those are people they're surrounded by for like, Probably 35 to 45 hours a week, if not more. And that's a huge chunk of your time. Like, if you're going through stuff personally that's stressful, you're gonna, that's gonna come out in those relationships. Like, when I was getting divorced, I mean, I was like freelance, I was on like a bunch of retainers or whatever. But like, I looked at it the other day, and probably like, 75% 75% of my income comes from people that I wasn't working with at the time and the people that I was making money from at the time, a lot of those like eroded or faded because I was like trying to get personal shit in order, you know? So, I mean, that's different than micromanagement, but it does speak to the thing that like we try to wall off this garden where like work is one thing and your life is the other thing, but like they almost like have to blend together, especially if you live in a capitalism, you know? So <laughs> uh, like on our thread on Twitter, like uh, I think it's uh, I think it's Katie Spencer Johnson says that a lot where it's like, it's not worth like balance. It's almost like they're going to have to be blended. You know, you've got to figure out like where, yeah, there's no such thing as a balance. There's no such thing as work-life balance. And it's the same, it's the same in a relationship yeah. where where nobody gives 50-50 in a relationship. Not right. ever. Not right. ever. Right. right. Somebody's always picking up for the other person. That's what right. team that's what teams are. Right, for sure. And then that's like another thing too that I think is interesting. I was talking about this with a guy yesterday that has like one of those HR software startup deals. Yeah. I think it's interesting to a lot of people that run teams or organizations don't even seem to understand this. It's like, okay, first of all, micromanagement obviously creates disengagement because you're going to constantly feel like, oh, I'm not doing well enough. Like my boss doesn't think my work is good enough. You're going to become detached from that job. Right? So what happens is like, what bosses do a lot, and I've seen this probably 15, 20 times, is like when they feel they need to micromanage like Joey over here or whatever, they heap all this uh, work on people they think are good, but then you burn out your best people. And you, so like at the same time, you burn out your best person and you make somebody that could be a good employee completely detached from the job. So like, the process of micromanaging screws like literally every single person because the manager doesn't have an effective team. The best people on the team get all the work now, so they burn out. And these people down that probably could be productive, beneficial employees, they like they feel terrible about themselves, so they don't do any good work either. So it's like the whole ecosystem is set up for the whole team to basically fail. And it's like that's what's so unfortunate is people don't even see that the secondary and tertiary repercussions where like you always end up burning out the best dude or woman you have on your team because you keep all the work you think 
you have to micromanage back on them. So that's where like the whole the wheels start to fall off that bus too, you know. Yep. Yeah. I just wish it was like for all the for all the like where tech and all this shit that we have nowadays. I wish there was like some type of program that could be designed to reduce micromanagement. Um, but uh, but I don't. Here's, I just, here's the tool to reduce micromanagement, and you and I both know this. I mean, we 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 speak on this all the time. The tool to reducing micromanagement is to eliminate management altogether. You should be having leadership. Yeah, yeah, and like. This because is when, leaders, when leaders are leading, they are not micromanaging. Right. They are leading. This is something that we could probably do a whole show on and we will in the next couple of weeks. But like big Tom Reed topic is like the whole difference between management and leadership, which is like still somehow very unclear to many people. So, okay, you never hear the term micro leader, right? Just <laughs> manager because like yeah if you're leading you don't have any need to be down in the weeds doing this other shit right and, uh, okay so i was saying before we started taping i was talking about this bar across the street from my house so about three weeks ago uh, one of these guys that's a regular there he's like married with three kids so like i'm not really sure why he's a regular there but let's gloss that over right <laughs> so he like you don't he, know <laughs> He comes in one day and he's like, hey man, a couple nights ago I saw you in here and you were arguing with some dude and I didn't want to get involved. What was that about? And I was like, oh, so there's a couple of hotels near me or whatever. So some dude from like Charlotte was staying in one of those hotels, came into that bar, we were talking, and he's CEO of like a 300 person, 350 person company, right? So... I was asking him, like, okay, as CEO, like, are you looking at shit two to three years out, or are you, like, trying to get stuff out the door today, you know? And uh, he's like, no, I try to look at stuff two to three years out, but I feel like I always have to manage the work we're doing now. And I'm like, why are you managing work as the CEO, you know? And he's like, well, what are you, like, like, he thought I was getting up in his face, right? And I'm like, I just don't think, like, CEO should have people like lieutenants and processes whereby that work is getting managed. Like he shouldn't be doing it. Right. And so we got in this argument where he's like, well, have you ever been a CEO? And I'm like, no, not of like a 300 person company, but I manage all my own shit, you know? So he's like, well, do you look like two years down the road? And I'm like, yeah, not every day, but I do it sometimes. Just like, yeah, hey, how sustainable is what I'm trying to do here, you know? And uh, so we got into so fucking argument, nothing got resolved. He just like went back to his hotel. But I think like, okay, if you're a CEO and you're like worried about like the day-to-day -day work getting executed on, you're probably not a very good CEO. Like you shouldn't be down at that level thinking about that stuff i think and, people like that don't understand what ceos do and i think that becomes a big issue right and then like okay then you get into this thing too where like uh the elephant in the room on all this micromanagement stuff is like the compensation side of it is that if you're making more money but you're just basically doing the shit you did two roles ago because that's what you remember and understand you shouldn't be making that extra money it should go somewhere else so, like, that's the thing, too, is that you get this, like, Peter Principle stuff where, like, people are promoted, like, slightly above their head or whatever. And then, like, they cling to what they know. So you're basically, like, flushing a bunch of salaries down the toilet because these guys are doing work from two levels ago, but they're getting paid, like, two levels up from that. And that makes absolutely no sense to me. But, like, organizations have done that for 40-plus years. Right. And then it's the same with this dude I met from Charlotte. It's like, if he's a CEO, he's probably like the highest compensated person at that company, whatever they do. And like, if he's legit managing task work on a, like a Wednesday, why is he the highest paid person then? Like, that doesn't make any sense, you know? 
Should we should we do a should we do a vignette about what each major position in corporation is and what their jobs are? Uh, yeah, because, we can do that. We because can do I that. think that I think that these entrepreneurs become CEOs right. of these companies, and they're not. They're still stuck in their freelance brain. They're still stuck in their entrepreneurial right. mindset, and they they're not leading. They're managing, and that's not what a CEO does. Yeah, no, it's not. Like the CIO isn't down in tech support on level three, on tier three tech support helping people. You know, the, the CFO isn't making bank runs and doing your and doing your account sweeps at the bank. Like these yeah. chief officers, I think people don't understand what those positions mean. So I think that I'm going to write that down. We need to go into, we yeah. need to vignette on I that. And like, there's a dude on, uh, there's a dude on Facebook that I got, like I got up with through like some entrepreneur guy in Philadelphia. He was like, yeah, you gotta be friends with this dude on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. This guy is based in North Carolina. He posts like fucking three to four just rants a day about entrepreneurs and like hustle and all this stuff. And like, honestly, I think a lot of it is inaccurate. <laughs> like, cause he's talking about being like, CFO, CEO of your like startup or whatever. And like, I agree with you. Like, CEO isn't the person making, like, a CFO's not making bank runs. They're not like, um, they're like not, I don't know. It's just like, I think, yeah, we definitely need to do a vignette about that because there's just like a lot of confusion about what some of those roles are, you know? Well, okay. Yeah. So, for example, when I'm the executive administrator of an oil company that shall remain nameless, right. that literally does not mean that I'm their secretary. Right. That literally means that I'm overseeing all of their secretaries. Right. And that I'm, prob I'm probably making travel arrangements. That's probably one of my things. But I actually lead a team of secretaries who work for the vice president. Right. Who are right. these people are making the major decisions day to day that are driving stock prices up and that sort of thing. Right. That's it's a really high level shit. It's not when I say I'm an executive administrator and I see this on like on Craigslist a lot. These executive administrators, they want a fucking personal assistant. They want a low level, uh, entry level. They say executive and they might want to pay you twelve dollars an hour, but they want you to do entry level stuff. And if you are right. a business administrator. Mm, oversees the office operations of the entire business. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's the that's the other thing too is like, I feel like we need. Uh, I'll I'll make a note on this as like a full show. Just like the salary side of the coin too is like I've seen that even in the fifteen years that I've been like in the professional world, I've seen that gotten so much worse in the sense of like. Okay, I'll keep the company name out of this, but like, I don't know, maybe like five, six times a year, someone will hit me up about some full-time like office thing, and I'll usually say no, like maybe I'll consider it a little bit. But like, some dude came to me, and it was like a director title role, like a marketing director level role, and he literally had like 27 bullet points he wanted this role to do, and then I was like, okay, well, like, it could be interesting. So, like, just up front, let's talk about comp just to, like, see where that aligns. Yeah. And he was like, oh, I was thinking 38000 And I'm like, dude, first of all, like, I have experience. Second of all, like, you want someone to do 28 things in a week and pay them less than $40,000? Like, I don't know, man. I don't, like, so then what happens is, like, this is a little bit uh, off kilter from the micromanaging thing, but what happens is you either get an entry level person who probably can't do the 28 things. So now the role is mismatched or you get somebody that's totally fucking desperate because they've been unemployed for 30 months. So like usually in that case, they come in all hot, like, Oh man, I have a job again. I'm so excited to get started. And then, the whole disengagement thing happens and they fucking fall out of favor with it. Because they're like, all right, now I've done this for 90 days and I'm making shit money. 
Right. It's like, oh, wow, like, I'm getting emails at 10 p.m. on Friday about, like, the fucking Instagram account, and I'm making, like, each of my paychecks is, like, $900, you know? Yeah. Like, which, is, which is, like, okay, so, like, administrators in big oil, um, most land attorneys understand this because they hire administrators because attorneys right. are attorneys, and then they have an under-administrator who basically manages their secretaries pretty much. But what that really means is that that's, that's often a very high five-figure, very low six-figure salary. Right. So people don't understand that, but, but you have to, especially with the 25 years of experience I've got, I'm not accepting anything less than 70, probably, right. if someone right. comes to me. Because right. to be frank, you, especially when you step into that role, I mean, it, and we're totally off topic of micromanaging at this right. point. <laughs> no, it's okay. We can weave it together, you know. Um, um, but okay, so so let's go back to micromanaging. So so I work in that role, and I'm I'm under five VPs of a big oil company that shall right. remain nameless. Right. But there are at least almost always two to three in that group of five when I was there that would do that. Right. It wasn't their job. I was perfectly fine if they would regularly tell me I was fine at my job, but they still felt like they needed to be breathing down my neck. And making sure I was micromanaging the pool of secretaries and other workers, which right. I'm not a micromanager. Like, do your work. And if you can't do your work, we'll have a chat first thing in the morning at five o'clock when I'm at work to get, you know, with a cup of coffee and we'll talk about why you get to keep your job. Right. That's literally how I run every team I'm on. If you're going to come right. in and not do your job, then you, and, and you repeatedly not do your job, then we're going to discuss when it's convenient for me, which is usually about five or six in the morning with a cup of coffee. <laughs> like, yeah. Why you get to keep your job. Yeah, for sure. Um, because I don't micromanage. You're an adult. If you don't know how to do the job, you need to ask for help. I'm happy to help. Right? Um, or you need to find a, a different job. You need to find a better fit for yourself somewhere else. Or maybe I need to find a better fit for you within the company. And that's always an option as well. It's a, that's right. another topic we've discussed about if they're not fitting, then you need to find them someplace else in the company if you can. Right. Well, then that's the other thing too is like this does tie back to like the micromanagement side of it. It's like what if you're always like over the work of people, like if you're always breathing down their neck on the work or whatever, how do you even know what their capabilities or strengths are? Right. So like, okay, I guess that's the other thing. Like probably should have brought this up earlier, but like, if you like, I guess a lot of people that are micromanagers are not that self-aware, but if you like, okay, if you know that you're that type of person that feels like they have to have a hand in everything that gets out the door or whatever, why are you even allowed to have headcount in an organization? Because like, why would you bring in somebody when you're just going to can do all their work or like try to adjust the course of all, like you should almost just be viewed as like a one person individual contributor team and like never be given headcount because like, what's the point of hiring or like spending to hire somebody if that's going to be the outcome, you know? Right. Um, you're it was, ultimately costing the company a shitload of money. Yeah, for sure. And like, that's, a, I would, I forget, <clears throat> dude, it was like long enough ago that I forget what org I was even doing work with. But like, there was one, there was like a marketing team in some company that I did some stuff with where like, it was about an eight to 10 person marketing team. And this shit turned over like every five months because the guy running it, was like what it, what we were talking about 15 minutes ago it's like micromanaging all the people at the middle to the, the low to the middle and then the high performers get all the work heaped on them because he feels he doesn't have to micromanage them so every three months the best people leave then like he can't he doesn't feel comfortable elevating the people below them to like more responsibility so they get disengaged they start looking for other jobs so like probably twice a year he was hiring completely new teams you know or like every month he was adding like two new people as replacements i don't care if that dude is driving like 
hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue somehow, it's still a net loss, you know? And it all starts from my, like the fact that he's micromanaging everybody because then it's like the whole team, regardless of how good you are, how responsible you are, the whole team is impacted by that in one way or the other, you know? Yep. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, it's like a, it's a dark cloud over a lot of organizations, you know? Um, yeah. So, uh, um, I don't know if we've actually solved it aside from like putting like trying to put more self-aware people in leadership roles. I do kind of think like one thing that you see in white collar all the time that, uh, that sucks is that guys get promoted because they're like good number hitters or whatever. Right. Um, and like, that has no correlation to like being an effective manager or leader. And like, there's been research on that since the seventies, if not before, but we keep promoting those types of guys. And like those types of guys are the exact guys we were talking about at the beginning who are going to have the biggest problems with this stuff because they don't like, they probably don't have full control at their, in their home life. They probably feel like a little bit stressed by some stuff there. And like they get promoted to a level that's like over their head. Like they were good at making a number, but they're not supposed to like, they're not supposed to be like leaders of other people, you know? Um, uh, Yeah. So I don't, I just feel like the only real path through it is like, I would also say this, like just about, who we put into leadership positions in general. I don't care if somebody is like really good at achieving certain numbers. If there's a person in your office who everyone clearly relates well to and like goes to when they have work stress or like problems they need to talk about, that person should become a leader in that organization because like, guess what? They already are a leader. They're already a leader. Right. You just haven't like vetted them financially, but like I worked at, I I think I'll say the name on this one because I was only there for like a 13 week project, but I worked at McKesson, like a huge healthcare company. And there was, yeah, there was like one lady on the floor I worked on and she was like probably like a 70, 75 K a year employee. Dude, everybody went to this woman for every problem like whether it was where copier paper is or like I think I might get fired. Like regardless of the scale of problem, everyone went through her. And I always thought it was amazing, like make her a VP of that department because like everybody's already going to her anyway and they clearly respect her. Right. So it's like putting her in a leadership role, she'd actually be a leader. She wouldn't just be like hovering over you while you complete some task, you know? Yeah, that's the thing I think companies miss, like, because we want to think that we're promoting, like, the best, like, most productive people up a ladder, but, like, uh, we really need, like, people with self-awareness that are respected by others, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right, and that's, that's, I mean, that's probably as close to a solution as we're going to get. Right. In this 40 minutes. (laughs) Yeah, for sure, because it's like a... uh, Because it's like, you're never going to solve it with some program. Like, one place I worked, the place I moved to Texas for, um, he had that guy, uh, Patrick Lencioni, uh, who's like a management consultant. He's written a couple books. Yeah. He had that guy come in and, like, talk to his executive team. And, I mean, nothing changed, right? So, I go to a trade show in Vegas. I guess I can tell this story because I long since got fired from that place. So <laughs> I go, I go to this trade show in Vegas, and I met one of uh, his consultants, like junior people that was working on the account with the executives at the place I worked at. And we got drunk at this bar in Bellagio, and he's telling me that there was like some exercise where. And this, like, this does speak to micromanaging, to, so there'll be, like, an uh, end point to this. So let's say the CEO has seven people that report to him, right? Yep. You bring all seven people in the room. You bring the CEO in the room. You put the CEO in a chair at the front of the room. 
and everybody writes down two good things about the CEO and then one negative thing or one thing he can improve. So you put all of them in a hat and the consultant starts pulling shit out of the hat. So in this case, the first two were positive and then the third one was one of the negative ones. And he says, a good leader, like a normal functioning person, good leader, will hear the first negative one and be like, oh, okay, like, guess I need to improve on that. Bad CEOs are like, who said that? Like, who wrote that? And he said, like, man, when we did it with your company, that's what happened. And I'm like, yeah, no shit. But that, to me, is the same deal with, like, micromanagement. It's like, if you can't even... If you can't even understand that failure is a natural part of the cycle, that like course correction is a natural part of the cycle, then obviously like you're going to fucking manage like that too. So there is no like, there is no consultant driven solution to this problem. It's just like, we need to be better about identifying who the real leaders and organizations are, you know? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's probably a good, uh, I think that's probably a good place to conclude that one then. Seems like a good spot. Yep.